What can we learn from the manuscripts? We can learn that we can learn some facts. For instance, that when she was um, a teenager, she was quite an appalling speller. And you actually see her spelling improving from volume the first through to volume the third. So from the age of about 12 to the age of 18, she's getting better at spelling certain words. Um, we can see things like that. We can, we can see that she couldn't, she had a problem with words that had G or J in the middle. She was spelt majestic with a G, and it's quite triumphant when she eventually gets it right, and you see her crossing out a G and putting a J over it, you think, yes, at last she's got it. Um, what else can we learn from the manuscript? We can learn how she worked, and how she worked was very important to who she was. Um, and the Watsons is fascinating in that respect because she clearly made little booklets. She took large sheets of papers that, paper that she bought from the stationery shop and she cut them in half and she folded them down and she cut them again and then she folded them again and made them into little booklets. And the Watsons is little booklets of just eight pages. Well, by the time you get to Sanderton, the manuscript has 32 pages in a booklet. Um, so there's a sense of confidence, I think, in those booklets as they grow. But clearly she did need, I think, the feel of, of, an, of a novel growing under her hands in, in book-like form. And not all writers then or now do that. Um, the other thing I think you learn from a manuscript is her extraordinary confidence as a writer. Because she is writing first drafts into booklets. Um, Hilary Mantel, the um, contemporary great writer, um, is very interested in how you write. And she said that she doesn't know of, of, of many writers who would have the confidence to write straight into a booklet. Most writers, when they start, will write on bits of paper, just individual bits. And then when they've got a certain body of material, they'll move it into a booklet. Because a booklet exerts a kind of tyranny over you. You know, you have to keep going forward. If you decide it's wrong, you've got to scrap it, start again, or possibly patch it, as Jane Austen did. But it, there's a tyranny there which perhaps only great confidence in knowing what you want to say and being sure from the start you've got it right, only that can overcome that sort of that tyranny. So I, I think that's very interesting. I, I, I think she perhaps stored a great deal of material inside her before she got to the booklet, and then she had the confidence to work. I think the frugality of the booklets is interesting too, and this, this seems so of all her grown-up manuscripts, is that she will start a draft, and it remains the only draft, I think. She's overwriting it, she's patching it. Um, she's concentrating her effort, and I think part of the concentration, not letting herself sprawl across lots of paper, I think that was essential, an essential discipline for her. And when you think about it, it translates very well to how her fictions work. You know, a small number of families, concentrated um, engagement with them, even down to the trivia of their lives. I think there's a correlation between, in other words, the materials of the manuscripts and the artistic development. The trouble is that we only have manuscripts remaining for works that she did not finish. The, all of the novels, Pride and Prejudice, Emma, Mansfield Park, as far as we know, there are no manuscripts. They have never come to light. I don't think there's anything mysterious about that. I think the, they were just routinely destroyed. Once they were turned into print, Jane Austen didn't think that the manuscripts mattered. And it was, she was writing just before the time when authors' manuscripts had value in themselves as, you know, saleable artifacts. By the end of her century, by the end of the 19th century, you have Hardy and Conrad actually creating manuscripts to sell, you know. Uh, do you want another copy? I'll make you one. Um, but in Jane Austen's day, that hadn't happened, so we just don't know. We've got, um, we've got two chapters from Persuasion that she discarded but we think she discarded those just before it went to press, and they are divided up into chapters. 
On the other hand, if, if you look in, in, um, in her juvenile writings, she's already experimenting with novellas or perhaps even novels, and she hasn't as yet divided those into chapters. So it's tantalizing. We don't, just don't know. My feeling is, though, that she had, by this stage, this was the fourth novel, fourth full-length novel, if it was going to be a novel, uh, she'd, she'd embarked on. I think she would have been carving out chapters from the beginning if it was meant to be a novel. So I'm not totally convinced it was meant to be a novel. She's also a reviser who, and I think this is the only point where I would disagree with Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf, looking at her manuscript, said she's a writer who starts with the bare bo bones of a story and then expands it. Actually, she doesn't. She pairs it down. She works the other way. I think she, she makes it more economic. She's more disciplined as she goes on. And one thing you do see her doing and, um, in several of the manuscripts is her choosing a word. Um, he was a, an agreeable gentleman. And then she'll cross agreeable out and she'll think of another word. You know, he's a handsome gentleman or a charming gentleman. She crosses that out and then she goes back to agreeable. And that happens on lots of occasions. She'll have a second thought and then she'll return to her first thought. But she only returns to it via a second thought. Um, and she often does, you know, she often does sort of, as it were, back her, back her instinct. Having, having thought, she thinks, no, I was right. Mm. But it, it, is, it is interesting. I, I think you're right as well. You do learn a lot about a writer from, from their, their revisions. I, I, I have very honoured to be a patron of Jane Austen's uh, house, and people often come to the house and they say, you know, it can't be true about, about the, the squeaky door, and it can't be true that she hid her papers. I think it may be true. I don't see that it has to be a myth at all. Um, I think writing on small pieces of paper was important to her, else why did she do it? <laughs> and we do have plenty of evidence to suggest that, that she did, and, and I can never imagine that the novels for which we don't have manuscripts were written on small pieces of paper. Um, now, you could think of that in lots of ways, couldn't you? You could see it as secrecy and a wish to hide from others what she was doing. Um, it also makes it all that much more portable. She could carry it around and write wherever she wished, and there are stories within the family that she did take her manuscripts around with her. She was visiting um, aunts, um, and, uh, she was visiting, sorry, her, her, uh, um, her brothers and, and nieces and, and nephews would talk about, you know, Aunt Jane sitting in the corner and suddenly leaping up and laughing and running to her manuscript and writing something down. I don't see that we should discount those stories. Um, it seems to have been well known in the family that she was a writer. I don't think it was well known what she was writing always, you know, just another of Aunt Jane's novels, I suspect, but people didn't necessarily know the mechanics of what was going on. So I think she openly wrote within the family, um, but I think the small paper was important to her. I think it was important as a disciplining ground. You know, she worked on a small canvas. She said that herself. That's what she liked, and she liked it to have a, a material manifestation as small. Um, and she could carry it around. Um, secrecy, I'm not so sure about, really. But one thing you do notice, have you been to Jane Austen's house, is how little privacy there was. You know, it, it's a big cottage. You can't say it's a small hovel or anything like that. She wasn't living in deep penury. But um, there were lots of women in that house, lots of visitors, and then there were a couple of servants. She didn't have a room of her own. Um, so I think a certain desire perhaps for privacy rather than secrecy might have kept the manuscripts small too.